What's up YouTubers? On today's video we're going to go further in depth with actually welding some joints. Now my previous couple videos we welded up some test plates. Now I got to be honest with you. You don't really want to be starting to weld on these actual joints, be it a butt weld, fillet weld, lap weld, until you can really run a bunch of passes in a straight line overlapping. And I know you guys, like, you get a taste for welding, you like it, and you want to rush right in and get some actual, like, welds done where you're joining two pieces of metal. And I totally get that. I like the enthusiasm, but you have to understand that the better you can do this, the better your actual welding is going to be. And if money's a concern, a piece of metal like this costs nothing. Running through clean metal piece after piece trying to learn to weld by actually welding like lap welds or butt joints or fillets is going to get pretty expensive. And not to mention, it's going to frustrate you. I mean, trust me on that. So, like I said, when you get like a whole plate filled with overlapping welds and your start stops are decent, they don't have to be perfect, but something decent and you don't have a problem starting the rod, come to do this. So let me get this out of the way. The easiest weld arguably to do would be a butt weld, but that's only in some respects. Like on thin metal, a butt weld is a lot harder than say a lap weld. So in the case of thicker plate, this is going to be pretty easy. I mean, the whole goal here is to start a rod, strike the arc at the end of the plate, run it all the way down, whole rod, end at the end of the weld, obviously end of the plates, and then you're good. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. To be consistent with the previous videos, we're going to be welding with the 6013. It won't be long before we're no longer welding with 6013s, but I wanted to have the most basic of the basic lap joint uh, butt and fillet welds all done with 6013 so that I know that any one of you guys out there and girls can do what I'm doing because I know this rod will run on whatever stick machine you have. Just make sure it's on DCEP if you can for me. Thanks. Um, so what we have here is a set of plates, quarter inch thick steel. I completely cleaned them up at any point where there may be a weld. Now, for you guys out there, rather than starting with quarter, you may want to start with like 3 sixteenths. It's a little bit cheaper and you probably won't burn a hole through it either. So if economics plays a role, start out with uh, the smaller plates. Now we're going to be using eighth inch rod. You can totally use 332nd rod on this as well, so that's not an issue. If that's what you have, then you can make do. Just keep in mind, 332nd rods produce a smaller weld than 8th inch. Now, the trick with doing these, and on thick plate like this, you can run pretty much unlimited amperage and you're never going to melt through. Like It's just simply not an issue with quarter inch plate, which is good because you don't want to frustrate yourself blowing holes. Now, I'm going to set the machine, if you remember, if you recall, on that flat plate, I was welding that doing lap welds at 90 amps. Well, I can tell you that 90 amps isn't going to leave much of a weld on here at all, like penetration-wise, so we're going to have to up the amperage. And that's a good point to make right now. And trust me, I don't want to sit here and do book learning more than we have to, but i got to cover this before we get into it. So... On a flat plate, you can run a weld no problem at 90 amps and it looks halfway decent. When you're welding an actual joint such as this, you have two pieces that are going to pull the heat out of that weld and that weld is going to solidify pretty fast on you. So if the faster that solidifies, arguably the less penetration you're going to end up having. So the 90 amps are running a bead on plate. We need to up that. We'll try 100. We'll run a little weld maybe inch, inch and a half, somewhere in there, we'll look at it, we'll determine if it's hot or cold or just right, and then we'll continue on with additional weld, and we'll keep looking at it and see what the welds are telling us. All right, I'm going to put a tack on both ends here, 
Um, one thing, and I haven't mentioned it before, get in a habit, I tend to spin whatever rod that I put in the stinger, I spin in the jaws, and for whatever reason, it just seems to help with starts sometimes. Like that uh, rod that's inside of here that gets clamped in there sometimes gets, I don't know if it's mill scale or what, but by spinning it, it cleans off that end that's in the stinger. And it, I don't know, it seems to help with the start sometimes. So let's tack this and then go from there. All right, so we got that tacked. I long dark arced it on the start there a little bit. I didn't think it was gonna start, so I tapped it against the table. So we got our two plates combined. Now, if you're welding on thinner material, um, say under 3 16 thick, you're gonna have a lot harder time not blowing a hole. Like I said, on this at 90 amps, we're not gonna have any issues whatsoever. Doesn't hurt to at least brush it a little bit. All right, I'm gonna weld probably a couple inches and then we're gonna look at it. Oh, got a little bit of slag peel there. Look at that, how nice. Let's take a look at what we got so far. Now, if you notice, plates are no longer flat, and that's gonna be pretty typical. When you put a weld on one side as that weld shrinks, it's gonna pull the plates together. You can see there's some heat affected zone through it, so we definitely ran you know, some heat to it, but obviously nowhere near full penetration, nor would you ever expect that. Overall, our weld is fairly straight. I don't see any signs of slag inclusions or porosity. My start over the tack was better than I expected, to be honest. Um, I do not have hot start enabled on this machine at all so i'm welding just like you were if you had a dc just standard stick welder nothing fancy for settings yeah i would say i'm pretty happy with the way that weld looks height wise it's not too humped up this is about what i'd be aiming for and i'll bump it up 10 amps and i'll restart there and weld about the same distance and we'll look at it all right, so I got it at 110 amps. Let me set this out of the way. Another thing I wanna mention is make sure you clean your material. When you weld over mill scale, instead of this bright, shiny metal where it's ground down to clean, um, that can impart all sorts of issues. Like you can start getting undercut on the toes. You can start getting cold toes where they doesn't wet into the plate. Eliminate as many variables as to why your welding kind of sucks to, to really hone in on that. And I'm, not, I'm not trying to be offensive here. I'm just being honest. Like when I started to learn to weld stick weld, you know, when you have too many variables, it's too hard to troubleshoot what's going on.
All right, well, look at that. Made a couple mistakes, imagine that. So what was going on here is I was welding, everything was kind of going okay. The rod uh, was kind of spattering quite a bit. And as soon as I went off track, the crack filled up with some of that slag. I brought it back, tried to get it in line. It started to weld okay. And then I got uh, arc blow near the end. And a good indication of arc blow is your arc, rather than just being kind of clean, it just starts blowing out to the side. And then you start seeing big BB buckshot coming out of there and you can see a piece of it there. And I'm sure in the video, you're gonna hear the sound that it made when I went off kilter there. So I pretty much shut it down right then and there. Like once you start getting arc blow or have an uncontrolled arc, just shut it down, grind whatever is screwed up out, restart, go ahead. Now the amperage wise seems like uh, when I was welding, almost like it was excessive, but uh, I'm not really sure on that. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna restart again right here and with a better vantage point where I can kind of see what I'm doing better and follow the line. We're gonna see how it turns out and then go from there. All right, again, so I was welding right on the crack. It was going okay. And it just, within I'd say a quarter of an inch, I started to get uh, what appeared to be arc blow again where big buckshot started coming out of it. I really think it's probably just uh, too much amperage maybe, which I know sounds a little bit ridiculous, but this rod 6013 isn't really known to be a high penetrating rod, nor is it meant to deposit a lot of metal. And I think it's just a byproduct of uh, that because I definitely like the way it welded better at uh, 10 less amps. So what I'm going to do for the sake of this experiment is I'm going to up it to 120 amps and go even hotter. And we're going to see what happens. I don't have high hopes for this, but uh, that's the point of experimenting. And that's... A good point, like so many people out there that are learning to weld, you guys are going to be afraid of using too much amperage. It's like, well, how do you know is too much, what's too much amperage unless you run so hot that you can't control it? So running hot isn't the worst thing in the world. All right, that actually ran better than it did previously. So I think maybe what was going on is just because this camera's in the way I had my arc angle, probably too much of a drag angle rather than, you know, kind of like here is where I should have been and now it's too much like this. Anyways, that ran better. Plate's definitely a little hot. If you look at it, way flat, way wide. I mean, you can just see the difference versus down here versus here. Much wider weld. I like the look of it overall. You can tell how hot this was. Well, besides the fact I'm melting my glove. Um, if you look at how flat and the ripples are just very close together. When you look here, it has almost, I'm not calling it a stack of dimes, but you can see a more distinct like movement with my travel speed versus here, it's almost the same height and width. And again, the overall width of it tells you much hotter. So I like that a lot. Uh, what I'm gonna do is grab another set of test plates and we're gonna try and do a continuous weld end to end at the increased settings of uh, 110.
I wanted a quick mention here. It looks like my rod angle is pretty steep drag angle. It's actually not. It's just the way that this camera looks when it's shooting from overhead with the lens that's uh, being used right now. It kind of warps everything. But I'm closer to being upright more than I am lean back. It just doesn't look like that. So let's see what we got here. Now, definitely at the end, there's no question that this was arc blow. Um, and I, I'll leave the video, well, you saw in the video, it was running pretty smooth. Everything kind of was going good and all of a sudden it sounded like I jumped up like 10, 15 amps and it just kind of threw out a ton of material out of there. The reason that this happens, and I'll do a whole video on arc blow, but I'm running this rod pretty hot. This is an older rod. That doesn't help. Definitely doesn't contribute towards it. 6013, again, isn't my favorite rod to run. If you, I was really concerned about the arc blow issue, I'd just weld it on AC and I'd never have that issue. But as soon as it happened, I stopped. And what I'll do, I wire wheeled that. I know that I can probably restart and then weld it out to here and I'll be just fine. The key is not to keep welding after it starts because it's gonna wander around and it's just gonna deposit a weld that is just gonna be, I guess, not terrible, but it's uh, not gonna be proper. So backside, definite heat input, still no penetration through, which again, you're never gonna see on this thick a plate. So what I'll do is I'm gonna finish welding this and then I will uh, chuck this in my vise and we're going to break it and look at it. So I heard that again. It basically started blowing out again and I think I figured out why. The inner edge on this plate is not cleaned off so there's still mill scale. I flipped these the wrong way. So I'm welding with mill scale inside of this at where they join together. And that's likely the culprit that I'm hearing that's causing that. So I'll definitely the rest of my plates, I'm going to clean both sides so I don't make that mistake. So let's uh, get this cut up and then do a break test. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to cut the end off where the welds looking pretty good on both the hotter and the colder side of this. With that cut off, I'm going to put it in a vise and we're going to put a pipe wrench on this or something and hopefully be able to break it. I would imagine it will, but we'll find out. All right, place your bets. Will it break? I'm going to lower it a little bit in the vise. I know that this is going to break because there just isn't that much penetration. But that's kind of the fun part of doing welds and breaking them is you get to learn how strong something really is. I'm hoping this breaks easy so I don't really feel like cracking my ribs doing this. Yeah. Yep. All right. Broken weld. Let's go and look at it. Well, let's see what we got here. I'll put a HD version of it up for you to see since it's a little bit hard to see here, but I'm going to describe what I see. So the pass out was run hotter, and this is the cutoff parts of the plates we broke. So the start when I was running at, I believe, 90 amps, and then the end where I was at 120 amps. Now, I noticed, so the start of it, 
the first inch that was run at 90, very minimal penetration. The little dot that's below the weld is not porosity. It's just that the plates are curved, so it did not fuse that. If the plates were flat, it would have, uh, you wouldn't see that, I guess. But again, a little bit roped up, not a whole lot of penetration. The last weld, which I believe was at 120 amps, way wider, flatter, but overall the penetration profile doesn't look, I mean, it looks better, but it's not really that much deeper. I mean, obviously I much rather have the hotter pass for penetration, just the overall bead appearance of it, but the actual depth of penetration, not really that far. Had I cranked it up to 130 amps, there wouldn't have been any more penetration either. The rod just wouldn't have handled it that well. And at 120, honestly, it was starting to have some issues as well. Like you saw in the video, I got arc blow. And I think just the flux, just the combination of everything just couldn't handle that kind of settings. And like I said, I'm not the best at welding with 6013. I much prefer 7018 or 6010, but that's not the point of this video. Um, and as you can see, honestly, both plates are nowhere near penetrated through. I mean, they're like a sixth of the way through at best. So a quarter inch thick plate, you definitely want to bevel it. There's no question about it. And that goes whether or not you're running 6010 or 7018 or 6013. Now, the reason I broke this is to kind of demonstrate that you guys at home can learn a lot from simple tests like this and let me zoom out here there we go so if you were to run a butt weld like this and you saw i kind of screwed up a couple places that's the point of this video we, we need to learn from this so i lost track of where i was going and then i had arc blow i had this that pretty much all the problems in the world now when i did the brake test where i broke it I 100% knew it was going to break, or at least thought I would, and it was fairly easy to break, as would even a normal properly deposited weld would be fairly easy to break. And that's not the point of this. What I want to do, and I'll put a higher detailed version up now, you want to look at the edge of your weld, and you want to see that the weld actually has bit into the side of the plate. So when you look at here, the line of the penetration is in further than the face of the plate. That's important. Now you can see there's very inconsistent bead profile and penetration. There's an essentially lack thereof. And I'll put this where this was, simply because it didn't tie in at all. The last thing that you wanna see is like a straight line, like what you see here, where like the plate is untouched on the edge. You do not want to see that. You want to see where it bit in. And again, we knew what we were going to find in there just based on visual appearance, which brings up another very important point. Most welding um, tests, like visually, you would fail this weld. There's no point in even testing this because visually it, it fails. So realistically, most of the welds you guys actually put down, you can visual test and look at and know whether or not it's a good weld or not. Now don't get me wrong, you can be hiding all sorts of stuff in a decent looking weld, but if it doesn't look visually, then it doesn't even pass to go on to the next step. Now this, where I ran a pass, hit some arc blow, restarted with the same rod, of course, because I'm an idiot, and then rewelded it, had more arc blow. This, other than this part, looks pretty good overall. So, a tad bit on the hot side. This rod really isn't going to have much penetration either, despite being run at the same 120 amps. But again, overall, better looking weld. I'm going to break this open and then come back and we're going to look at it and compare it.
Now that other weld broke pretty easy. This thing I already tried. I almost could hang off of this and I'm no spring chicken. <laughs> much, much harder to break that. Let me just get the BFH out here. There we go, much better. Get one of these if you don't have it. I think Wilton makes it. Great, great BFH, get yourself one. So we had a little bit different of results with that. We're much higher amperage, much more consistent weld end to end, took massively more force. The other one almost took no force to break. And now we did have more weld on this, so I guess it's really not an apples to apples comparison, but trust me, even if I had nipped the plates off, this thing would have held way more weight. And the reason is simple. When you look at this, and you look down here where the bare edge of the plate's exposed, there's no strength there because, well, there's no weld. And then you look at the overall gray, which is where the weld penetration is a dull gray, and it barely like penetrates at all for most of this. Because you can see the shiny metal, that's base material, that's not weld. Well, when you compare it to this upper one, which is the one we just broke, the weld is almost not, I would say about a third of the way through the plate end to end. So significantly further, deeper penetration, way more consistent. And again, I'll put these, I'll put them on top of one another. Maybe that'll help you visualize it as well. Just compare the dull gray where the weld is to the shiny metal. And you can see how little this penetrated. And that's really where your strength is going to come through. Now, had I beveled these plates, we could have done a two, three pass weld, probably three pass weld on this, and I would have never been able to break it. But you can see huge differences there. And this is something, I mean, you can do yourself at home for free, for no money. It's not hard to do. Just run a couple test welds and then break them. And then always keep your scrap because I'm going to be doing some more tests here further in this video. And look, I'm going to clean this spatter up a little bit, reprep them. Now we can do a whole nother test. You want to reuse as much material as you can. Be smart about it. All right, let's go to the next part. Now for you guys out there, when you're learning to weld in a straight line, you probably lose track of where you're actually going. Like you saw me do that exact thing in the, earlier in this video. Now with two plates, it's easier because you kind of have a line. And if you're just welding beads on plate, you can scribe a line. But sometimes you just lose where your position is. One thing I find that helps is if I li lift the rod slightly off the plate, the light from the arc tends to uh, come underneath the rod and it can help you reestablish where your rod position is. It's not perfect. Like sometimes you just don't know where you're at. And in that case, break the arc off, clean it up, start over. You're better off doing that than welding, you know, a half inch off the plate thinking that you're, you have it, I guess. You know, an old school welder told me once, if you can't see it, you probably can't weld it. And he was pretty right. I mean, I've been trying to weld stuff I can't see, and I've been pretty <laughs> disappointed with the results every time. So he had, he had a pretty good point. And not only that, um, he recommended, and he was probably in his 60s at the time, but recommended getting a cheater lens. Now, my eyesight's decent. It's not the greatest. It's definitely getting worse the older I get. Uh, if you really can't see what you're doing, it, may, it wouldn't hurt to try a cheater lens, which is like a 1 or 2x magnifier you put in your welding hood. That may help you see better. Not to mention, take it off my head, getting a better hood. The clarity of this Lincoln, Lincoln Viking is unbelievable. And honestly, I wouldn't be half the welder I am without it. So anyways, enough of that. Let's get back into this. You saw me weld quarter-inch plate 
up tight. I'm going to leave a whisper of a gap, still do a single pass weld, and we're going to look at the difference in the performance of the weld. And this is kind of to show you how much little things in what you do make a huge difference in the performance of something. And normally, like quarter inch plate, like I said, you're, you're beveling this, you're doing a three pass weld at a minimum. You know, you're not going to be doing this a single pass weld, but again, we're just looking at the differences. Due to the gap in the plates, I'm going to tack it and I'm going to run about 100 amps. We're going to have to fill some of that gap up with rods, so we're going to end up using more rods so our travel speed will be a little bit slower. And we're going to run a little bit less amperage. I tacked it up, gap's a little bit wider on this end than it is down here, which it will tighten. I'm going to start welding down here and as it solidifies, it's going to pull these two plates together. To tack with a gap, it's pretty easy, especially when you're using uh, eighth inch rods like I am. I struck the arc on the corner here. And then I brought it over and then I brought it back over where it was and by that point it bridged it. Now there isn't very much, if any, penetration down in there. You can see that. Again, this is just training practice, not an issue there. But what I'll do now is uh, I'm going to position this where you guys can kind of see it. And I'm going to run from the tighter end to the wider end. And I'm going to just let this rod push and fill in there. So let's talk about what we have here. Let me stand it up. <laughs> the first half of the rod I wasn't really pushing enough in, so I decided about this point to just start pushing more in, and then the gap also tightened a little bit, and then it cleaned everything up to where it looked really good. So I just didn't have enough pressure on the rod, and I think on the back of this we're going to see that the first half has a little bit less penetration maybe and then the back half probably goes a little deeper. Definitely flatter there, but I really like the way that this looks for this back half of it. Let's flip it over and see what we got. Again, we're not really going to see penetration all the way through. Let me grab it in another place. Sucker is hot. <laughs> all right. You can see the weld is definitely penetrated a lot deeper than it was before, more than likely. And you can see how much that gap closed. So 
much smaller here as, a, as I was welding. It tightened up quite a bit, and then that kind of stayed where it was, which I believe oh, that actually was the end, so the end didn't tighten up that much near there, just mainly in here. Although we got more penetration this way with a gap, we ended up pulling the plates together, which is going to impart warping to it. Which brings up a great point that I haven't really talked about in a video. And that is, if you want penetration, running a gap is pretty much a must and or beveled plates. But that also having that gap will impart a lot of warpage. And that's where a lot of guys or girls make mistakes welding stuff. Like if you need something to be like say a perfect 90 degree like this, okay, if you leave a gap between the two parts and weld it, it's gonna pull a lot. If you're welding parts, I don't know, something on your vehicle and you leave a, let's say like an eighth inch, and that was, a, I'd say a strong 332 gap almost, at least eighth inch, well, and you want it to be perfect, well, if you weld it with a huge gap, it will shrink and it will pull. So if you take that into account, you can plan for it, but if you don't take it into account, leave a gap and weld it, it's just gonna bend everything and you're gonna have fitment issues. So I'm gonna let this cool off. We're gonna chuck it in the vise and we're gonna try and break it and take a look at it. Alrighty, I got this thing chucked up in the vise. We'll see how much pressure it takes to actually break this. I don't know that I'm actually going to be able to break this. I'm just lying. I'm going to get this broken. Trust me. That are my ribs. <laughs> Good thing the hospital's only about a half a block away from me. Honestly, about the only thing that saved me on that is kind of flexing it up and down while putting pressure on it. Just a steady pressure wasn't going to do it. There we go. All right, the top plate here is the one that we just welded, and then the bottom plate is essentially what we previously broke. So I'm comparing the two. Now it took more strength from me to bust the top plate. And it's hard to tell on the camera, but the penetration is slightly better running with the open gap. I'd say maybe 10, 12% more. Had I ran a little bit more gap and a little bit more, pushed a little bit more rod in there, I think we would have got it even better because the slope of this plate kind of is concealing it. But the penetration running the open gap was a little bit better. The profile of the weld, if you look at it fairly flat, and I'll put these two together so you can actually look at it. There. I mean, somewhat flat, I guess. I think I definitely could have ran more amperage. I only ran that at 100 amps. Had I ran it at 110, I think we would have saw a little bit more penetration and results would have been a little bit better than what they are. But again, it does have a little bit more penetration. And remember, we ran that open route at 100 amps. We ran this at 120. And we got slightly better performance at 100 than 120 simply by running a gap. And had this been even thinner steel, like had it been about 3 16 thick, we would have pretty much had almost full penetration on it. And that's, you know, you're not going to get much better than that. With all of that said, so far, I'm liking what I'm seeing. I can definitely tell you that the 6013 rod is not uh, a very deep penetrating rod. You're going to see when I do these videos in the future with other rods that there's going to be significant differences. But overall, not bad so far. Let's go on to the next exercise. 
Everything we've done so far has been in the flat position. And the reason I'm doing that is you really need to get good at welding everything in the flat position before you go and start doing horizontal, vertical, and uh, overhead. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my welding clamp here. Now, I'm not gonna leave a gap between these two, but I'm setting them up in a V configuration. The point of doing this is so that we can do a root pass and then multiple passes all in the flat position in order to get used to doing a couple things. One of which is this will prep you for doing uh, V grooved out plates for doing full penetration welds. So that's great practice for that. And this also gets you ready for doing multiple pass welds since you're going to be doing welds on this with three, four, six, you could go, you could go 15 passes on this exercise if you want. So the first thing we're gonna do is tack both corners, then obviously we're gonna remove the magnet, and then we're gonna weld it. There's a whisper of a gap in there, not a big deal. I'm just gonna brush this out. And this is a start. So what we need to do is in a flat position, weld this together, let it cool, chip the slag off, and then we're gonna do two more passes. I didn't mention it earlier. You wanna be careful with magnets like this. This is a very powerful magnet. If you keep this in the vicinity of your arc, it will cause the arc to wander over to it or be repelled by it, depending. So you don't want to generally leave those on for anything beyond tacking. Amperage wise, I'm going to leave it at the same 100 amps. Slag ran out in front of my weld immediately. And I'll show you. That's what happens when slag gets in front of your weld. So I struck the arc, I didn't have enough of an angle, and I didn't shove it down in there fast enough. And then I entrap slag. See that? Very common. That's why you want to strike and get down in there. The other thing I should have done is I should have ground that down a little bit to get it closer. So when I'm welding on it, I'm not up here and then drop off in the never, never land. In order to fix this, I'm gonna clamp it to the table, come in here with a uh, hard rock and I'm gonna grind that out. So I ground most of that out. I should be able to get the rest with the brush here to clean it out. But now with that tack ground down, I can start here and just flow it out. And then that flux won't get ahead of my rod like it did. You don't want that. And that's kind of a lot to do with 6013. It's pretty notorious for having the slag run in front or the flux in front of your rod. All right. That should be a little bit better there. Yep, still did it. See, so take a look. See what happened? We're going to clean this up, grind it out again, and then we're going to fix this. All right. It's all ground out. We're going to up the amperage 
to 110 and see how well that works. Now it did it again where the flux ran in front of the weld puddle. And I'm gonna share some tips on how to prevent that. Now, you can see I've done something kind of the same three times in a row and the results are pretty much the same thing. So at this point, we gotta come up with a solution on how to troubleshoot what's going on. So let's clean this off. So you can see it looks better than it did before, but that flux was really running in front of it. So there's a lot of ways that we can fix this, and that's kind of the point of what I'm showing you here, is that anytime you make a mistake, grind it, clean it up, and then reassess and make a decision on changing something, change it, reevaluate, try it again, you know, see where you're at. Now we still haven't fixed it, I, yeah, I was welding, but I'm telling you that flux, I'm probably entrapping slag under there and you can't really see it there, but more than likely we are. And I'm gonna explain part of why we have what's going on here. And a viewer had asked about this in a PM to me. When you weld on a flat position plate like this, what you're gonna find is, as you can see on this rod, see how that tip of that rod is back in the flux quite a ways? Well, what ends up happening is you have all the distance from the rod tip of the flux to the rod. Plus, if you tighten that up, you can see, and I'll show you. See that gap underneath the rod there? So not only do you have the distance from the inner part there to the flux, but then the flux to the rod. That's a huge arc gap. So part of the reason why this is swirling all around is simply because your arc gap, despite shoving this rod down in here, is just entirely too long. One way you can help take care of it is to up the amperage, which will burn more flux off and will reduce the arc gap, which is why over here, you can see our end result is better than it was, okay, then the first couple shots at it's better, but it's still just by visual while I was welding was not good. So what I would recommend in a situation like this in the flat position, not on a fillet weld, but on a flat position, is to down uh, size your rod by one size. So I'm running eighth inch here. We're gonna go to 332nd size 6013 and we're going to run that. And the reason is, is it will get tighter into this root due to the angle of the plates, which are slightly tighter than 90. And it will help you get a weld in there that's cleaner. And we're going to try that. Sixty thirteen, three thirty two, or 2.4 millimeters. 40 to 90 amps. So we're going to try 80 amps. The reason 80 is because we're on the high side for thickness of what you would want to weld. So it can definitely take the heat and we'll try that. There's still some slag I got to remove in there. Like you can see some on the toe there. But uh, overall, once I got it laid down in there, 
you can see looks pretty good once I finish cleaning it up. I welded over the end just to kind of flatten it a little bit, a little bit more clean up in there. But you can see by downsizing the rod and running it on the hotter side, because that rod's able to get down in there a little bit closer under a more controlled arc gap, it just flat out welded better. Now had I turned that eighth inch rod up to maybe 130 amps, 125, I might have been able to get that to burn down enough by shoving it in there to get it to work. But in my experience, I just find for like a root pass on something that's tighter than 90, I find that running 332, generally speaking, is going to be better simply because you can get it down closer and keep a tighter arc. Um, if you turn up the amperage enough, sure, no problem running eighth inch, but you can see how well that worked, much better than what we are doing before. So don't be afraid of downsizing your rod to get a little bit better arc gap in there. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to finish cleaning this up, and then I'm going to do uh, two passes on top of that with eighth inch. Yeah, I definitely, I got most of it cleaned out. There's still, it's still a little rough in there. What I think you're seeing there is it just didn't wet out. My travel speed was going a little too fast had I pushed in more rod like I did right here, all the way through there. That's perfect, that's what you want. And again, over here, it's a little bit cold. But I cleaned it out the best that we can do it. We're gonna run two passes. Now, I'm gonna run one pass on the left side, focusing pretty much where the arc and the rod will center on the left side of the toe. We're going to clean that up, and then on the right side, I'm going to come in and put it, the second pass on there. So, so we're going to have a total of three passes on this guy. It would also help a needle scaler really helps. You're going to find that inside corners like this are going to be the hardest to get all the slag out. If everything isn't perfect and you don't fill it in just right, like this section here, you're going to have issues getting it out. So a needle scaler, an uh, air-powered needle scaler will help you. So I ran it down. It might look like I completely covered the weld and I sort of did, but you can see there's still an edge of it there and you can see how much more situated this weld is on this side than it is that side. So once I run a second pass in there, it should flow it out nice and flat. A little rough in there, but we can make it work. I don't see any slag on the toes. That line there is just from the other weld. So I think we're ready, we're cleaned up. Let's run that last pass and then wrap this video up. Now to keep this accurate, I will weld it in the same position as I did before. So I welded the outer one further from me, now I'm gonna weld the one closer to me. Here, I'll show you what's going on here. You see how that rod blew out the side? That's partially me because of the angle I had it at. These things definitely aren't welding the best and sitting around for, I don't know, 10 years. Let me uh, knock that off. So I cleaned it off and you can see we got slag entrapment in there. And that's simply because that flux, again, as I started it, it started to get ahead of the rod. I'm going to buff that out of there, and then uh, I'm going to use a fresh rod, and we're going to start again, and it should be all right. Ground that all the way out. We're going to start back over here with a new rod, and we're going to weld through that.
So here we go. It's all cleaned up and cooled off. So let's take a look at what we have. The start, definitely cold. Had an issue where the flux was trying to get ahead of the rod again. If I had enabled the hot start on my machine, I think it would have squared that all away. Even though the plates are preheated, this edge wasn't really that hot and just getting it to start and flatten out right away, a little difficult. Once I got past the initial start, everything was pretty much smooth sailing all the way down. The end here, I kind of got a little over hot, overheated a little bit, blew this corner out a little bit, not a big deal. Again, this is practice, right? The weld is pretty much exactly flat, three passes, so pretty cool. So what did we learn today? Well, I can tell you I learned a lot. Um, one of the things I'll, I'll definitely say is that I could use more practice running 6013. Um, I'll tell you what, it is really difficult to control that flux from getting in front of the rod. When you see me weld with 7018 and 6010, you're not going to see any issues like this with those rods, but this rod in particular, it does take some practice. If your machine has hot start, definitely use it. The other thing that, and I kind of mentioned it in the video, this 6013 rod, you really have to push on it. It seemed very easy for me to just like kind of let it do its own thing all while the flux was extending and the rod was burning off higher and higher inside the flux. And next thing I know, it blow out the side. What I thought was arc blow, which it was indeed arc blow, but it was kind of, I believe, caused simply because I wasn't putting pressure on that rod. I'm used to 6010 and 7018 where I don't have to put that much pressure on it to get the arc gap to be where, where I want it. This rod in particular, and maybe I could have upped the amperage and it would have helped, but just seemed to me like I had to put a lot of pressure to keep a tight enough arc on it. So that's something a little different. Again, it's a practice thing. Uh, I don't find 6013 that useful overall from a standpoint of what I build, but if it's what you got, practice with it. You can make decent welds. I mean, most of this is looking really good. I'm sure if I did another one of these, I would knock it out of the park and make it look perfect, but um, I don't shoot perfect stuff around here because you guys need to learn just as I do that uh, how to fix mistakes and how to straighten things out and how to troubleshoot. That's what it, what it takes to be a good welder. With that said, thanks for sticking along for this video. I will be covering more welds and other positions coming up. This I thought would just be good because this is the precursor for doing multiple pass fillet welds. And you should do one of these and then fill this all the way out to here. Keep running passes, let it cool. Give it more time to cool between passes than I did. So there you have it. Catch you around. Thanks.